Campbell, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, also known as CCAST. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. For anyone unfamiliar, CCAST is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges like introduced aquatic species. And CCAST supports different communities of practice, including this non-native aquatic species community of practice, which was launched in May of 2022. And so if you would like more information on CCAST, this is my plug or our communities of practice more broadly, um, feel free to reach out to myself, Christy, or Matt Graybaugh, and we'll go ahead and drop, Christy is already on it, and drop those emails in the chat. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christy to talk a little bit more about today's webinars and introduce our guest speakers. Thanks, Carly, and welcome, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Christy Miner. I'm the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. And webinars like today's are just one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And today we're very excited to host a presentation from Mark McKinstry, who will talk about the effects of a waterfall on fish in the San Juan River. Mark is a biologist for the Bureau of Reclamation in the Upper Colorado River office in Salt Lake City, Utah. He works on endangered fish in the Colorado River Basin. So just one final reminder before turning it over, um, like Carly said, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat box and I will make sure they get to Mark with whatever time we have remaining. And with that, Mark, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, uh, Christy and Carly. Uh, Christy, can you still hear me? Yes. Want, yeah, okay, sounds good. good. Just want to check. Um, okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, hopefully everybody can hear me well. I'll go on to the next slide here. Um, so this talk is uh, done in conjunction with uh, a couple of graduate students that I work with um, over the last few years, but primarily with uh, Matthew Bogart, who is now a salmon biologist with Washington Department of Natural Resources. He did his master's at Kansas State University with Keith Gitto. And, and uh, is providing most of the data and information that uh, I'll be providing today. Um, although there was another grad student, a PhD student, um, Keith or uh, Craig, um, uh, sorry, Casey Panock, um, who did uh, a bunch of work that was prior to Matt and uh, sort of set the stage. And, and, and some of the work that he did sort of um, led to the work that, uh, that Matt eventually then worked on. So the picture in the background there is the San Juan uh, River waterfall. Um, give you a little bit of a roadmap here of what I'm going to do. Uh, so I'm going to talk um, what and where the waterfall is, how and when the waterfall formed, what fish are affected, and then the initial results of early fish work. Matt, the work that he did um, is really why the project is important. The methods of catching, moving, and tracking fish, and then the results of his study. Uh, and then finally, I'll finish it off with uh, where this is happening in some other places and what this means for the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and then one key thing to keep in mind, even though I'll be talking about primarily the, uh, the Paiute Farms waterfall, which is at the base of the San Juan River uh, near where it enters Lake Powell, um, we also, Matt also did some work at a structure that's about 150 miles upstream of this location at a place called PNM, which is Public Service of New Mexico, and it's a power plant weir. And so he did some moving of fish up there as well to do sort of a compare and contrast uh, with what we saw at the waterfall. Um, this is the waterfall, um, as uh, you see from downstream at about 600 CFS. Um, regardless of what some people have said, this, this, this is not passable for fish. <laughs> uh, we're not dealing with salmon in the, uh, in the Colorado Basin. So even though a salmon might be able to get up this, uh, our fish have no hope of getting up this. Um, and you can see an electrofisher there in the background, which is our primary mode of sampling down here as well. Um, the waterfall is located um, down here uh, on the San Juan River. This is the San Juan as it starts up here. This is the goosenecks of the San Juan, if you're familiar with that. 
Um, and then as you come downstream, I have several places here where you can see uh, where the lake actually ended. So in 1985, the lake was all the way up here. Um, and then slowly the lake receded down. This is gonna be important in another slide um, to where now the lake is actually down here um, past the Great Bend of the, uh, of the San Juan um, into Lake Powell near a place called uh, Nescahai Canyon. Um, and so this is various locations here. Um, it's about 125, 130 miles to travel from here to the inflow um, down through the lake and then upstream here just to Bullfrog. So this is not a real easy area to access. Um, and in fact, that's one of the major problems of, of doing work down here is trying to, get, trying to get a boat that you can also run in the river, but also works in the lake, especially if you've got pretty bad conditions out on the lake. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how this waterfall feature formed. And it's a feature that's actually happening in some other places as well. So if we look at the original uh, river and what it looked like, this is what it looked like prior to the closure of the dam in 1963. This little circle in all of the pictures is the location of the current waterfall, okay? So this is where it is right now. So the lake filled up. Um, and this was after it was, you know, completed in 63, sometime in 70, certainly in 83, you know, it backed all the way up. And so it flooded this entire area. Uh, this black line is the original channel. Um, and then in 92, it actually receded down. Um, and so it went downstream um, of this location. And there was actually a, uh, another waterfall that was located here, right about in this location here, but, but the river then came around and went into this area. So it did not go over here where the waterfall. In 1998, the reservoir filled back up, um, but then starting in 2001, well, late 90s, and then in 2001, the river actually jumped out of its channel uh, and came down here to the present location. So it's going off of this sandstone ledge. So it's important to keep in mind that it's out of the original channel. Um, and that process is called uh, superimposition. Um, and it's uh, not important that you understand the name, but it's, uh, it's kind of an important for how these things are, uh, are formed. So if we look at where this waterfall sits uh, with respect to lake elevation, this is uh, the elevation of the lake here on the left. Um, the full pool of the lake is this dashed line here along the top. Um, the elevation of the waterfall is here at about 100 or 1125 feet, and it's this dotted line, okay? And then the dark black line and the light gray line are the pool levels of Lake Powell during the year. So you can see that, you know, when the lake fills, it's pretty high, but then it draws down during the year um, as you go through time. Now, I don't have more years on this, um, but, it, but it doesn't matter because it's been low um, ever since then. In fact, 2011 was the only year really since 2001 uh, that it's even come close to filling back up. And then from there, it's just kind of headed down. Uh, but what you see is that, like I said, here in 2000, it started heading down. And, and an important thing about this is this waterfall is located at about the 90 to 95% full pool level of Lake Powell. Um, if it was further down, you could see that maybe it wouldn't have an effect like it does. But because it's so high uh, that, that even when the lake is full, like during a normal year, um, it could easily be drawn down to a level that is below the waterfall, even in a year with, or, uh, with, with high lake levels. So, so this waterfall is present. And importantly, it's something that we've been dealing with in the program uh, really for about the last over 20 years. Even though we like to think of it as being an ephemeral thing, it would go away, it has. So, so that's an important point to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, March 9th of 2015 was sort of a seminal moment in our program. Uh, and, and this picture kind of cap, captures that. I know it, it looks kind of silly, just two people sitting on the bank with, a, with an antenna. And that's what that is, is that's a pit tag antenna that we contracted with Biomark to construct and build for us. 
And what was important about this is we finally got to the point where we had an antenna and it, it, a lot of people that work in the basin that, that do a lot of fish work, they'll recognize this because this was the original wagon wheel antenna that was invented by Biomark. But the important thing about it is it had a battery on it um, that could run this device for approximately three or four weeks as opposed to having cables and lines coming off the bank that would have to power it. Um, or importantly, a battery that would only last uh, for a week or two. And on this day, we had just pulled this antenna from up here at this location at the waterfall. And uh, Nate Cathcart here on the right is downloading the antenna. Um, and and it's like, once again, a seminal moment because we had been doing work up here, but had never found many fish, did not know what was going on there. But when we downloaded this antenna, over a three week period in March, uh, late February and March, we found that uh, there were over 450 unique fish, pit tagged fish uh, that had hit this antenna and all of those were uh, endangered fish of some kind, whether it was uh, razorback sucker or Colorado River pike, primarily razorbacks at this time of year, but, but we did get Colorado pike in it too. So, so at that point, this became a real, a real aha moment that said, wow, you have something going on down here that you didn't know. Um, so then we decided that we would start doing some work, trying to figure out what was down there. Um, and this is important here because as I mentioned, we get uh, a lot of razorback suckers here. In fact, this was the second largest razorback sucker ever captured in the upper basin. And that was just a couple of years ago. Uh, but we catch all kinds of razorbacks down here, as well as Colorado pike minnow. But importantly, we also catch non-native fish, uh, walleye, um, stripers. And so this, this barrier or this waterfall forms a very good barrier to upstream movement of, of fish. So when somebody comes along and says, why don't you just blow it up and remove it? Uh, keep in mind that this is the only location in the upper basin <laughs> um, where we actually have a pretty functioning barrier to non-native fish with respect to the four big uh, Colorado River fish. So um, it does do a very good job of keeping these fish out. So if we look at numbers of fish um, captured over time, um, here I've got numbers really just up to 2019. And this was summarized by Cathcart in a paper that he eventually published. Uh, but you can see that uh, in 2015, 16, 17, all the way through 19, we detect um, uh, pretty close to 500 to 800, 900 fish every year. And then we started going in in 2016 and trying to capture some of these fish. So um, here with Razorback Sucker, um, you know, depending on the year, we could get up to about 200. Um, we also looked at the percent of male, female, and it's pretty evenly split. So it's not a, it's not skewed really one way or the other. But once again, I mean, we also get uh, Colorado pike minnow, and this is when we were running the antenna only for a couple of months each year. So um, it's important to keep that in mind. We weren't running an antenna year round like what we are now. And so in any given year, this number of razorbacks is really closer to 1,000 to 1,200. Um, and then pike minnow, we can get up to a couple hundred in, in any given year. Um, and that's with an antenna that we've got at the waterfall. I've got some pictures there of it. So this is where um, we did some initial work and then Matt Bogard uh, came in uh, as a graduate student and looked at more specifically uh, short-term movements of these fish after we moved them upstream uh, in the river. And he did that work once again uh, with, uh, in cooperation with Keith Ghetto at Kansas State. So the background for his work is, you know, habitat alteration and flow regulation has led to, you know, reduction in connectivity throughout the Colorado Basin. Um, all of our fish, uh, well, other than humpback chub, have tend to have long seasonal migrations, so they can move all the way around the basin, all the way from historically what was the lower basin, all the way up to you know the Yampa River and, and beyond. So um, it's not like these fish don't move. In fact, we've documented razorback suckers moving from the Yampa River um, down through the Green through Lake Powell, and then taking the left turn and going up the San Juan River, and eventually. Uh, hitting their head at, uh, at PNM, which was a barrier. So um, what did we need to do? What's the mitigation that we needed to do to try to restore connectivity? So what we did is we went in and we uh, caught some of these fish. So um, in 2016 and 17, um, as part of some work, 
that uh, Casey Panock did, we moved about 200 fish a year um, up past the waterfall um, and then looked at where those fish ended up in the river. And this is PNM diversion, as I mentioned, it's about 150 miles upstream of the waterfall down here. But we had fish that, that he detected um, all through the river. So in fact, they would move upstream all the way to the next substantial barrier. And this was important because, I mean, at this point we started to realize, well, um, you know, we, uh, we need to probably be looking at this on a long-term basis. But here's the funny thing is, over 80% of the razorback suckers that were encountered uh, below the waterfall um, and moved upstream, eventually moved back downstream uh, into the lake or into the area below the waterfall at some, at some point within the next year. So, um, you know, these, some of these fish stayed in the river, but in fact, a large proportion of them went back to the lake. And uh, this life strategy was something that was kind of new that had been identified with Razorback Sucker that, that Casey Pinnock um, identified. It's an ad fluvial life stage where um, fish likely spawn upstream and then move back downstream to some type of a, a lake or reservoir habitat to spend the rest of their, you know, the rest of their life throughout the year. Um, so our questions for uh, Bogart's project was, what is the need for fish passage below the Paiute Farms waterfall? And what is the behavior of razorback suckers after they have moved up um, past, the, uh, past the, uh, the barrier? So the San Juan River includes 353 uh, kilometers of critical habitat. This starts from down here um, in Lake Powell. Um, here at Nescahai Canyon. So Nescahai is actually part of that. And there's actually a fair number of, of razorbacks in the lake. Um, and it goes all the way upstream here to, uh, to Farmington. And within this, once again, we have uh, two major barriers, Paiute Farms Waterfall and PNM. We also have another one called Hogback, but that one's been mitigated with some fish passage, although sometimes it, it's not always operating. So we do have some issues there, but those are the two main barriers and the locations where Bogart work. Um, this picture here in the lower right is a picture of the hogback weir, or sorry, the PNM weir, where they, they pull water out for uh, San Juan generating station uh, that actually is now going to be decommissioned and uh, this will be the site uh, where, at least it's thought, this will be the site for the intake for the Navajo Gallup Water Project. Um, and so this is what we're kind of looking at here at, at PNM. And so once again, that's pretty far away is up the river from, uh, from the waterfall. Down at the waterfall, we have a pretty good way to detect fish. We went in and we put several kinds of antennas, these little round antennas. This is one that's sort of fastened to this wall right below the waterfall. Um, and we get these detections from these passive integrated transponder antennas there. And we actually have a couple of them there. We have one that's sunk right here as well, an antenna. And these are all kind of temporary. They can be removed, they can be moved around or whatever. But here for the last five or six years, we tend to keep them uh, right here. But importantly, what we've done is there's a, uh, a database called the Streams or Species Tagging Research and Monitoring System, also known as Streams, in the upper basin. And that's where we put all the data. So that allows us to uh, sort of track these fish over time and see what happens to them. That's been an important part of this program. And I got to thank Dave Spees in the Upper Basin, a uh, coworker of mine for, for making that happen. And so it, it's been really a, a, a changer uh, for us in the basin in, in far, as far as looking at fish movements, especially across basin. So for Matt Bogard, um, he captured uh, his Razorback suckers in early March in 2016 through 2021. Um, well, that was part of that work was also with uh, uh, Casey Panock, and then we implanted uh, the fish with pit tags if they aren't already uh, trans or uh, present, and then we transported those fish approximately two to four kilometers upstream of the waterfall. We did it by shuttling fish around, then we had a boat upstream here that we would move them upstream, um, and that seemed to work, you know, pretty well um, as far as uh, uh, getting the fish up. And then we didn't have that much what's called fallback where the fish came right back down uh, and, and were detected on the antenna. So one of the things that Matt did was different from Casey. Casey used 
uh, sonic tags, which are acoustic tags that you can detect using sonic underwater receivers. And what we want is we wanted really more specific movements. So Matt used radio tags. Um, and so he implanted those um, into the fish and the transmitter life on those was about 300 days. And then importantly, they also put out a mortality indicator, so, which was nice, uh, but we didn't really have, there weren't that many mortalities. So um, it actually worked out pretty well. I mean, these fish are long lived and they did a good job of the surgery. So what they did or what Matt did is he did these mobile telemetry surveys. So he got in boats, um, just little boats with a receiver. And then he moved downstream um, from PNM Weir all the way down and then he tracked these fish. And I think you can see on the screen, but at various locations, we also had fixed radio uh, antennas where if the fish swam past, we knew that the fish had come past that location and it was fixed, one going upstream and one down. So we could tell whether or not the fish was going up or downstream. But importantly, one of the most important antennas was one right here at the waterfall because that way Matt could tell um, how soon fish came back downstream after they had been moved upstream of uh, the waterfall. And then the same thing with PNM for fish in his last year, um, when he moved those upstream of PNM, how soon they came back down past PNM. Okay, so we also did a, a, an annual abundance. Um, we estimated that using a uh, uh, Cormac Jolly Seaver model, um, and Cathcart developed this um, in 2018, and then he used GPS locations of individuals to estimate their uh, uh, distribution, and then directional telemetry at those sites, as I mentioned, those fixed sites, to determine residency time um, above the barrier uh, following uh, transport. Um, so here is our uh, mean detection probability as well as our pop estimates. Uh, and this was just for fish below the waterfall in every, any given spring. And one of the things that will jump out with you that you almost never see with, with these kind of things is look at these confidence intervals. They're really small. Um, and that is driven completely by this detection probability here. I mean, these things are off the chart um, as far as detection probabilities. I won't go in detail how we determine all this. This was some you know, some cool statistics from Mary Connor at Utah State University, but we used a combination of active captures as well as detections to come up with this. But once again, I mean, we came up with some really nice estimates. So in any given year, we've got about 750 to 800 to 1,000 fish that show up um, at this site below the waterfall. So, um, and we have pretty good uh, numbers on, on those fish. Um, so if we look at um, the age class of these fish, and this is just razorback sucker um, below the waterfall, we know this because most razorbacks are uh, put in the river. So they're stocked in the river at a 300 millimeter size from the hatchery. So we know um, when those fish actually um, uh, were stocked in the, in the year that they were born. And importantly for fish that we detected or, or not detected, but captured, that were not pit tagged, we took a, uh, a caudal fin ray from them um, and uh, we were able to age those fish uh, using uh, the fin ray, um, sort of like a tree ring analysis. But anyways, um, the important part of this is these are somewhat older fish. Um, we got, yeah, we got some younger ones, some that are, you know, two and three years old, but primarily these fish are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, all the way up to 15 years old. So um, if you look at a graph of this compared to the river, to fish that you catch in a river, these fish actually tend to be a little bit older than fish that you would just capture in the river. So sort of uh, some more evidence that suggests uh, that in fact, these fish probably are moving upstream uh, to spawn during that time of year. So if we look at the results of the facilitated fish passage, uh, this is PFW, is Paiute Farms Waterfall in 2020. Paiute Farms Waterfall in 2021, and then PNM, Public Service in New Mexico in 2021. This is the number of fish that were transferred, the individual fish that were tagged with radio tags, and then the number that were eventually detected um, after we transferred them upstream. So Matt was able to get detections on these fish later on and actually follow them around. So you can see that uh, it's almost 100%. So he had pretty good results 
of tracking these fish over time. Um, okay, if we look at where these fish were detected um, post movement, uh, we really see a couple of hot spots um, here, especially within the lower canyon. So he did pick up fish that did not move very far. And in fact, there is some spawning gravel here about two to three miles upstream um, of the waterfall itself, and then some stragglers here. But if you go upstream about 25 miles, what we found was, or what he found was, a real hot spot here at just upstream of Slickhorn Canyon. If you ever run the San Juan River, you'll know this because you almost inevitably camp here and then hike Slickhorn and then you float out the rest of the way um, till you get to uh, down here to Clay Hills. Um, this is Clay Hills right here. Um, and so this was an area that he suspected was a spawning area. In fact, when we went there, um, we saw that there is uh, pretty good spawning gravel. It's about the only spawning gravel in the whole reach from here all the way upstream. So they moved about 25 miles. And if you look at the median distance traveled um, within those fish, within that you know, two to three month period, um, you'll see that uh, they primarily moved about 35 kilometers, uh, but we did have some that went all the way upstream. So um, it's not like they, they all stopped there, but a significant number um, do that. So um, this is the stationary um, river antenna here um, that we've got down there at the Paiute Farms uh, radio or at the Paiute Farms waterfall. Um, and then uh, this is what this uh, um, area looks like in Slickhorn Canyon. So it's a canyon reach. Um, and in fact, uh, just this last November, we went out not, not just a month ago, but a, a year and a month ago, we went out and we installed a pit tag antenna here um, at this gravel bar um, to try to detect these fish. And we've gotten some results from that, but it's preliminary. Um, we'll probably be reporting on that at some other meetings later this year. But uh, anyway, what we're trying to do is to pick up fish that go to that potential spawning bar and then figure out how long they stay there. And this is what those spawning gravels look like. Um, at that location. So we grabbed some pictures of them and, and they're pretty decent. Um, they're not probably the best gravels kind of embedded, but once again, it's the first real spawning site that these fish come to um, when they come up. Now let's look at the results from the PNM fish passage, a little bit different. So this is PNM fish passage right here at the lower part of the reach. This is that hogback diversion that I mentioned. And these are fish that have moved, that have been moved upstream. Um, but you see that he detected them kind of all over, um, not a real, uh, real prevalent spawning site, although he did think that he identified something pretty close to the Animus River. But in both years that he was doing this work, the Animus River did not have really good spring flows. Um, and so we kind of thought, well, maybe the kind of flow that's needed to trigger them uh, to head upstream, maybe into the Animus to spawn was just not there. Um, in, in the two years uh, that he was there doing the work. But, but you can see that the minimum, median distance traveled here was about 12.6 um, uh, kilometers further upstream. So if we look at the results of facilitated fish passage between 2016 and 21, we see that you know in any given year, we transfer between 150 to 210 fish, something like that. Uh, this is the number that have been radio tagged. This is the minimum residence time. So the days uh, mean and then the range. Um, and so uh, what we see here is that we have, um, we have fish that really don't spend that long. I mean, they spend on average about two months um, in the river after they've been moved upstream. Um, and then this is, the, the percentage of fish, the numbers as well as the percentage of fish that are detected at the waterfall within a year of being moved upstream. So these are basically fish that have come back down and then either bang their head against the, uh, the antenna the next year um, in these years or are detected uh, using the uh, radio telemetry gear that, uh, that Matt was using. So what we see is, once again, this is that ad fluvial life stage. Uh, we see fish that come up, we move them up above the river or the waterfall, the barrier, and then uh, within a year, 
uh, and really even within about a two month period of time, about 60 days, most of them then go back downstream um, where they are uh, uh, probably go back to the lake. We don't know that for sure because we don't do that much tracking downstream of the waterfall into the lake, but they probably continue on and then hang out there in the lake uh, for the year until it's time to go back up and spawn. Okay, um, if we look at uh, the results of the facilitated fish passage, this black line is how long the fish stayed in the river um, after they were moved. And the orange line is the mean daily temperature. So this is water temperature. Uh, as an aside, we think that this is probably the driving factor behind uh, pushing uh, or causing um, um, razorbacks to move upstream into the lower river. And then this is the discharge at bluff. Um, and so you can see that over the years, what we have, what there's some data missing here. And what happened was this is during COVID. And so we couldn't get out and actually uh, get this data. And we had a, a problem with the antenna of the waterfall. But if you join these lines together and you'll see when I show you the second year, that's essentially what you do. And what you can see is that after about 20, 25 days, um, these fish are leaving. Um, and then once you get to 80 days, uh, you've got about 15% of them that stay upstream. Um, and so, you know, within, within a very short period, certainly within 60 days, um, the vast majority of these fish um, have, uh, have moved back downstream past the waterfall. And this is 2021, uh, the same graph as this. And you can see that really steep drop off, especially after day 2025 here. Um, where likely the fish are headed back down um, and it's really not due to any kind of flow or anything like that. They just, they probably spawned um, and have left the area. Um, if we look at PNM, it's a little different story. Um, the fish moved upstream there tend to stay a little bit longer. Um, and we don't have complete data here because these tags died out and Matt completed his thesis at this point. Um, but what we see is, is that, you know, the fish go in and then after day 20, there's not that as steep of a drop off as what there is at the waterfall. So as a rule, the fish uh, there at PNM, 150 miles upstream, uh, tend to, uh, to stay upstream. And so they're probably maybe taking advantage of some habitat that wasn't normally available to them up there. So in conclusion, um, razorback suckers tend to remain upstream of a barrier really just within that spawning season following the passage, other than, you know, if it's in the river, like upstream at PNM. And then uh, annual passage effort um, is probably needed to restore spawning and migration connectivity. Because when you get down here below the waterfall, um, there's really no spawning habitat down here at all. I mean, there's really nothing available. Um, although they do spawn out in the lake, um, uh, it, but as far as the river goes, um, there's not a lot of spawning gravels down there for those fish. So let's talk a little bit about what this means to the Bureau of Reclamation and, and, and the, importantly, the San Juan Recovery Program. So we looked at various fish passage options and opportunities that we have um, here at this site. Um, and there was a report that came out of our uh, Denver Technical Services Center uh, back in uh, 2021 that's available. Um, and what we did is we just did some modeling and tried to figure out if we were going to do fish passage, what, what would be some options that we could look at? Okay, <clears throat> the first one is to locate the fish passage just up, just downstream of Clay Hill. So Clay Hills is off this map up here about another one and a half to two miles up around the bend here. And then what we would do is we would start down here at the bottom and we would dig out the original channel all the way up. We'd have to burn this off right here um, and then cut it back around. Um, and then we would connect it back to where the original channel was and then essentially just dry this out. Because keep in mind, there is a, another waterfall right here that actually is, was almost worse back in the 90s. Uh, pretty significant. Um, it looked like it was almost uh, 30 feet high, but it, it was big. Um, and so we have to get around that. So basically just putting the river back into the original channel, but then build a fish passage um, up there. And it would require driving sheet piling 
into the river, uh, and it's pretty wide up there if you've ever been there, um, capping it off with concrete. So basically, in essence, building a dam and then putting a uh, probably a selective fish passage because um, there's, a, there's sort of some arguments that a lot of people are having as to whether or not we want to fully open this up or whether or not we want to keep it uh, as a selective type of a thing uh, to where we can keep the non-native fish out because it does form an important barrier to non-native fish. And, and I know that uh, Grand Canyon, although it kind of has it already, <laughs> as well as the upper basin would love to have one of these things in each of their rivers um, just to keep fish from moving upstream out of, out of the reservoir. So um, the cost of this would be plus or minus $15 million. Um, you know, it, this was a couple, three years ago, so it's probably more now. Um, you know, we don't even, we, really, this was a very preliminary cost estimate, so we really don't even know what the cost would be. The second option, quite a bit cheaper, probably closer to $2 million, would be to, this is the waterfall right here in the center of this one upper picture, but would be to just excavate a channel around the waterfall and connect it back upstream here with the river. And what we would do then is, once again, to meet this need of uh, selective fish passage is put a fish passage in that excavated channel um, and then uh, just excavate it around the water and try to a waterfall and then try to deal with the fish right here. The problem with this location is not easy to get into. Um, having somebody down here working uh, during the day, removing fish, you know, running the fish passage would be difficult, whereas Honestly, uh, having somebody upstream of here, three miles on the river right side, this is river left, um, would be easier because you can drive in and out of uh, Clay Hills a lot easier. The access there is just easier to get to, especially if you're coming from Moab or Monticello or Blandon. So um, it's an easier place to locate. But, and once again, the cost is substantially cheaper. Uh, but, you know, what, what do you do? This is also down in an area that could flood up. Um, so, you know, you, you, as well as it's a National Park Service unit, so you're dealing with those kind of issues as well. So none of these two uh, ideas is cheap or easy. Um, and, you know, we're still within the San Juan Recovery Program sort of arguing about <laughs> what, what is the, the most likely thing that we should do. So I'm going to finish this off by just talking about other locations that, uh, that this is likely occurring at and, and currently occurring at. Uh, North Wash um, on the Colorado River below uh, um, Cataract Canyon, and then uh, Pierce Ferry Rapid uh, there in the Colorado River below Grand Canyon. So I've got some pictures and some videos of these locations. This is North Wash. Uh, if you're all familiar with where Height is at, this is Height on this map right here down in the kind of the mid, mid center, lower, lower center. This is uh, the Dirty Devil River that comes in on the right, and all of the, the water upstream to the right, top right, is Cataract Canyon. So you float down, if you've ever floated Cataract, you float down, and right now, the Dirty Devil takeout, North Wash takeout, is right here at this square. Um, if you've used it lately, you know that it's kind of a disaster. Um, it's a heck of a mess. But maybe even more importantly, what's going on is the old river channel Go, used to go this way right here with this white checkered line. Um, the river channel now, though, bypasses this, goes around this little kind of uh, uh, sediment or um, uh, uh, oh, uh, sandstone ledge and then travels around here on this side uh, before it joins back into the original channel down that way. Um, Paul Grams and some other folks at uh, Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center, they shared this with me. Um, this is a potential hazard location. They have identified this as a potential ledge similar to what we have at, uh, um, at, the, at Paiute Farms Waterfall. We don't know this yet. It hasn't formed yet. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the, the lake elevations for this uh, barrier are a lot lower uh, as far as percentage goes than what we have at Paiute Farms Waterfall. So this area is more likely to inundate if the lake starts to come back up. Um, although it too has been present there for many years. Um, and I don't know the percentage of what the lake has to be to inundate this area, but it, it's certainly probably well less than 80%. So um, anyways, 
Uh, you've got uh, this issue here going on. Um, and I suspect that here pretty soon, this is gonna have to be dealt with because a lot of the bigger boats, uh, pretty similar to Grand Canyon boats continue down and then take out at Bullfrog. Um, a lot of private boaters, as well as some commercial boaters take out here at the Dirty Devil takeout. Um, but, uh, but if this forms um, and it becomes like the, like the rapid, either at Pierce Ferry or at the San Juan Waterfall, that's gonna be a significant hazard to, uh, to navigation. There's really no place to get out upstream of here. So if you're running Cataract Canyon, you're kind of committed to doing either taking out there, right there at the Dirty Devil or running down to, uh, to Bullfrog. Okay, this is Pierce Ferry Rapid uh, downstream of Grand Canyon. Um, this rapid became so dangerous that Park Service actually built a takeout um, just upstream of here about a mile um, so that you would not have to come down and run this. Um, this is a very significant rapid. Um, it doesn't look like much here, uh, but when you compare this rapid to anything in Grand Canyon, it is probably more severe simply because it is outside of the channel going around this, uh, the, this sandstone ledge. And then it's undercut all of this stuff over here on this river left side. Um, and this drop here, I mean, I'm standing 30 to 40 feet above it. And this drop is at least 15 to 20 feet. And the, the, uh, the velocities of water here um, are very significant. And we're actually working with Arizona Game and Fish Department as well as a contractor Bio West. And we're looking at whether or not fish that are down here below the rapid uh, can get upstream into Grand Canyon. Um, and this would be both native fish as well as non-native fish. And to date, we have some evidence that some fish get upstream, but this is likely a, uh, a barrier to fish that are down here. So both good and bad. And in fact, Grand Canyon, um, unlike most other places in the basin, is primarily native fish upstream of here. Um, and that's probably something that would be kind of good to keep going. Um, so this barrier um, is not a bad thing other than it has probably stopped razorback suckers from coming out of the lake or at least out of the river moving upstream. Uh, and we know that they did this because we actually captured larvae uh, um, almost eight, nine years ago at this um, upstream of here. And now we don't. For the last three years, we haven't. Um, and that's probably been due to the development of uh, this rapid, um, as well as another one um, that has just formed in the last year or so downstream of Pierce Ferry. So this was discovered by the people that were trying to run upstream from the lake uh, to get downstream of Pierce Ferry to do the fish sampling. Um, and uh, I think they call this maybe Devil's Canyon. Not, not really sure, don't even know that it has a name. Once again, this doesn't look like much, but this is likely a 15 to 20 foot drop with some huge velocities. I don't have a, a video of this, um, just this picture, but this is, not, uh, this is not something that just any fish is gonna be able to navigate. And you probably don't wanna run a raft through here either. I mean, it, it's significant depending on the flows, um, it, it can be pretty gnarly. So um, this was taken in the spring, you know, it was pretty muddy, but uh, I don't think you, you know, you, you, well, first you'd have to run Pierce Ferry Rapid, then you gotta come down here and run this. So, um, you know, when you look at these things, this is not just four or 5,000 CFS, this is more like 12 to 15. Okay, um, that finishes the, the talk from my side. Um, I do wanna thank um, the San Juan Recovery Program and the Bureau of Reclamation primarily for funding a lot of the work um, and uh, specifically the, the Bureau of Reclamation out of the Phoenix office, which actually had some uh, mitigation funds that they helped us with some of this work here. Um, there was a whole host of people that have been working on this for the last um, eight, nine years, uh, many graduate students, students, technicians, um, all these people here on the left, uh, a big shout out to Peter McKinnon, who's helped us with all of the detection stuff here. But then Fish and Wildlife Service has had a big hand um, with this. And then ASIR, um, uh, Limited Liability Company, has done a lot of sampling for larvae and fish down below here. So a lot of people really helped out um, with this work um, over the years. And so with that, um, I'll finish it off and take any questions if there are any. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark. That was great. Um, really great visuals in there too. That was enjoyable. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat so far. Um, people might still be digesting, but feel free to submit your questions or I think we have a decent enough crowd that you can just unmute and ask any questions you have as well. Yeah, I can kick us off. I had a question mark about the stationary bit tag antenna arrays. Were there any lessons learned in terms of like management or maintenance throughout the duration of the project for those antennas? I had a really hard uh, time understanding you, especially managing what part of the antennas? Oh, sorry. Let me see if I can turn my volume up here. You yeah, or maybe just get closer to the mic or something. I, I just didn't hear the last, this the real specific part of it. Sorry. Yeah, just for those stationary pit tag antenna arrays, were there any lessons learned in terms of management or maintenance throughout the duration of the project? Oh, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. So uh, what did we learn about managing those pit tag antenna arrays? Um, well, <laughs> I can tell you that the San Juan program has is probably setting the standard for using pit tag antennas in the base. I mean, we've got them everywhere. Um, and what we've kind of gone to are these single antenna units um, where we put them in the river and we don't have any communications or anything else to them, uh, but, but they're real easy to install. We can put them against a bank and then we have a solar system and a, and a reader. They're relatively cheap to get in. Um, and, and if you do have a flood that comes along and yanks it out, which so far, knock on wood, we haven't at these sites, um, you know, it, it's pretty easy to replace because you're still left with the electronics, which are up out of the flood zone. Um, and then maybe you got to reposition the antenna or, or refasten it down. So we've had good luck with that. At this specific site, um, this is where we did use that original um, uh, submersible antenna. And those things are now the number one seller at Biomart. <laughs> um, so we helped them develop it with the R&D part of it. But now they now, that's the number one item that they sell there. And they're sold all over the world. I mean, they take these things, everybody and their brother. I mean, the basin itself is buying a lot of them. But where people are using those things is in applications like where we're doing. They're just trying to get an idea of where fish are moving, whether or not they're hitting a barrier, where they're moving from, like you can put them at the mouth of a tributary further up in a spawning bed or whatever. And so getting those batteries, and they now have a battery that lasts over a month, which is really remarkable. And, and that was a game changer for us because a lot of these locations where we put these, I mean, they're not just, I mean, yeah, you drive to them, but, but it takes a day, you know? And so getting in and out of there, to these sites is, is time consuming and it's expensive. And so having an antenna that you can put out there for a month and it's collecting data, you know, 24 seven um, is really important. And then adding on to that and getting these other more stationary antennas actually installed in the river. And once again, man, I mean, the data is just mind numbing how it comes in. Now I wanna emphasize that we get a lot of data, uh, but to date, we're still turning some of it into information, right? So this is a great example of where we have turned some of it into information, but, uh, but we don't, you know, not in all locations have we done that. So but that's probably the biggest take home message I have is turn your data into information. Does that get at your question, maybe? Yeah, that's great. Great food for thought. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question. Any others? I threw this other video up there. It appears very rapid. This is at low flows. Um, I, I, I assume it's playing. Um, it's on a, a, a loop that just goes back and forth, but it gives you an idea of what that thing looks like and, and the drop to it and just uh, how it probably acts as a non-native fish barrier, um, as well as a barrier or anything trying to get up. So. Yeah, that's great. And we can see it. So. Um, David, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, you probably won't remember this, but we sat next to each other in a forum panel session in the Klamath Basin many years ago. Ah, um, yeah. And uh, this was really fascinating stuff. Thanks for sharing the story, the great videos and interesting work that's been going on with the tag and the telemetry. I actually had a question that I was just curious about related to the length frequency histograms that you showed for Razorback yeah, Tucker. Yeah. 
and it looked like what you had was essentially three year classes that sort of had were had done well or that had large larger numbers of fish just sort of moving through the years and continuing to be there and I wonder if that says anything about survival of stocked fish or maybe just the history of the number that were stocked or if there's something more to that yeah, I mean, that's a good question. We've not really delved into that as much, David. Thanks for asking that. I mean, it's good that you that you see that because I know you deal with that same issue, you know, in the Klamath. What I will say is this, is that um, prior to about, oh, I would say 2010, maybe 2012, we weren't doing a very good job of stocking fish in the river. Um, in fact, when I first started working with the Bureau 20 years ago, that was sort of my mandate was to get a better stocking program going with all age classes, especially for pike minnow and razorback. And so uh, I feel like we've been pretty successful at that, working with the various hatcheries with the states and the feds and everybody else. And so it's really only been here recently that we've really hit a lot of our target goals as far as stocking fish goes. Now, having said that, um, we know that a lot of fish do go down to the lake. Um, we capture fish down in the lake and we detect those fish down in the lake. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's a great question. Um, I would say, though, that the survival of razorbacks is not bad. I, I don't have those numbers specifically uh, that I would have to get Fish and Wildlife Service to kind of crank those out. And they have here recently, but it's relatively good. So if you can get a fish past that 300 millimeter threshold, which is primarily when we stock them. Um, their survival is pretty substantial. Now, have, now, having said that, one of the things that we're trying right now is stocking fish that are smaller than that 300 millimeter. In fact, two years ago, we started stocking some 200 millimeter fish actually at the inflow to Lake Powell in an attempt to see if we can get recruitment of a smaller life stage to an adult life stage. And the, with the idea being that if those fish do get to be an adult stage, keep in mind that about 60% of the fish that, this is what Casey Pinnock showed, about 60% 60 of the fish that are in the lake, eventually, well, it's between 40 and 60, so let's call it 50, um, 40 to 60% come out of the lake and eventually hit that antenna at the waterfall. So we have a substantial number of fish that are in the lake. But, you know, about 50% of them do eventually come out of the lake and hit the waterfall. So they come upstream about that 15, 20 miles, bang their head, and then they turn around and go back within a, a couple of weeks unless we shock them and move them upstream. So what we're trying to do is to figure out, you know, it's a recruitment bottleneck. And I think that's true of a lot of fish in, you know, I, I know it's true of your fish, especially up there in the Klamath. And so we're trying to get at that question, whether, where does it come? Is it at the larval stage? Is it at the 50 to 100 millimeter stage? Is it 200, you know, whatever. We know that if we can stock them at three and 400, the survival is good. Um, so, you know, if anything, I'll say that all of our work down in the lake has actually improved our survival estimates because keep in mind that using a parent survival, um, for if you're doing the survival estimate in the river, you would not be counting those fish that are down in the lake. So you would basically be counting them as, not necessarily as dead, but they wouldn't be counting towards your survival estimate. So now that we've started doing more work at the waterfall and detecting over a thousand fish a year, that that significantly bumps up that survival estimate. I hope that answers the question. Sorry, it was kind of long. But. No, that's good. It did. All sounds very familiar. Uh, interesting yeah, stuff. Yeah, Appreciate I knew it, it would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with your stuff. Thanks. You're getting somebody good there in the next few weeks, I, I suspect. So that'll be good. Well, to be to be transparent, I have haven't been there for two and a half years. I joined Fish and Wildlife Service and moved, but, but oh, I hear, gotcha. I hear about it. <laughs> so yeah. really Thanks, Mark. I believe Casey Panock is going to be out there before too long. So he's got a lot of experience with soccer. Oh, okay, so great. Be, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and thanks, Scott. Scott put some information in the chat um, regarding the the survival. Um, where the first year post stocking is 15 to 20% for fish about 300 millimeters and the subsequent survival was 75 to 80%. So a little bit more specific numbers there. Oh, he did. Okay. Uh, Thanks Scott yeah. for sending that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm not a scientist. I just play around with in the river. So. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you got the fun part. A lot of part. science here that I have not done. <laughs> Any other questions? We have maybe time for one more question. Hey, Mark, this is Scott. You know, I, I was just, I was wondering as you were going through this and again, great, great job. And again, cool, cool seeing all the, all the photos, uh, reminiscing on the photos and seeing all the videos as well. But, um, you know, you were kind of getting into some of that, um, that, you know, that management conundrum we've dealt with, with, you know, the, the, the benefit of keeping out um, non-natives, but also allowing native fish to get up to the systems and do their things. Like, can you elaborate, or do you want to elaborate on, um, um, I guess either, either um, what you think, you know, if you had the power to, to make a, a management decision, what you would do, and also, I mean, is it worth talking about um, um, the, the recent plans to build a spawning bar down there kind of as a compromise between this? Yeah, so I didn't talk about the spawning bar. Real briefly, uh, we came up with an idea, several of us, that why, instead of bringing the fish to the love, why don't we bring the love to the fish? And so um, what we're trying to do is think about, well, maybe we could build a spawning bar down there. And actually, Nate Franson with Fish and Wildlife Service is moving forward with that. Um, we have no idea if it'll work. So our, the plan is to put um, gravel down there that's of spawning gravel size and then see if we can get fish to spawn on it um, that are basically trapped. Because keep in mind, even if we move 200 fish a year, um, and moving 200 fish a year costs us about 100 to 120,000 bucks a year. Whereas if you do the math on that, that's about $500 a fish. Um, so, you know, it, it becomes, you know, I, I don't want to say it's an economic question, but you could easily frame it as such. Me personally, I think it's worth it um, because if we could get those fish to spawn, you know, those larvae would drift downstream. Um, and maybe recruit near the inflow. One thing that we did not talk about on this, and I won't elaborate this much, but we have a real problem in the San Juan River getting pure razorback sucker larvae to retain in the river. So our effective population breeding size for larvae that are captured in the river is only about 100 fish. So we have, you know, three, 4,000 fish in the river. Most of those are, are of a adult age to where they could be spawning. But we've identified through some genetic analysis only about 100 of those fish that actually breed in any given year or at a spawning bar. So that's kind of a weird thing. I don't have all the details for that. Once again, I'm not the science guy on a lot of this stuff. I'm just sort of reporting it. But, uh, but, but that's a trouble. Whereas we know that there's 800 to 1,000 fish down below the waterfall of about a 50-50% sex ratio. Um, that, that I believe want to move upstream. There's some argument there. Some people will tell you that, that maybe they don't all want to spawn. And I, I get that. Um, but uh, at least during the spawning season, you know, there's six or 700 of them. And I say, let's get them upstream to spawn. Let's let them do whatever they want. Now, having said that, it's not cheap. Um, let's do some quick math here. So uh, I, I did say that it was $500 a fish to keep trapping them and moving them. And we only move about 20% of them in any given year because it, it's time consuming. Um, it's a difficult place to work. Um, and so how do we, you know, get in there and actually, you know, get the work done and, and move fish efficiently. So let's divide 15 million, which is that one, uh, um, you know, fish uh, passage option. Uh, and if we move it by, if we uh, divide it by, let's just say a thousand, um, uh, whoops, wait a minute here, uh, 15 million. Um, and we divide it by a uh, thousand fish per year. Um, we come up with $15,000 per fish per year, but that includes some pike minnow in there as well. Um, but, but, but at that point, you've got your, your facility built, uh, and if you divide that further, 15,000 by 500, um, you come up with over a 30-year lifespan, uh, you somewhat paid for it. I mean, you still have to have somebody down there operating it, but, but you wouldn't need three or four people. So uh, it, long answer, Scott. I know you're trying to put me on the spot. For me, I think I mean, I'll, I'll just say it straight up because I'm getting ready to retire. I think it's stupid to let those fish just hang out down there um, without getting them upstream. I think they want to go upstream. 
I think they want to do their thing and, and spawn up there. Uh, but it is a difficult decision. It's expensive. Um, and for some people, it, it's a hard it's a hard thing to think about. And I will say this. I, the committee, I, I honestly believe that we'll have a very hard time, if ever, voting to build a fish passage there. Uh, the, the committee certainly seems split on spending that kind of money to build a fish passage. So uh, uh, just to throw in there for anybody that's wondering, we have tried other methods of of trapping fish down there, netting fish down there, anything but electrofishing. And to date, we have found nothing else that works. Those fish, they are smart, man. They get into these traps and then they get out. Uh, we've actually shown that with the, uh, with the antennas that we've got down there. And it's just crazy. Like they, they almost refuse to be trapped. Um, so it, it's a hard place to work and it's a hard conundrum. Electrofishing works. I do have some questions as to whether or not we should be electrofishing pre-spawn fish. I'm sure you do too. Sorry, Scott, I didn't give you an answer other than me personally, I would build a passage. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, all right, well, we're at the top of the hour. I'm gonna go ahead and close us out with some final thoughts and please check out the links that Carly put in the chat there. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, as you know, the webinar was recorded and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel, barring any technical difficulties by the end of the day today. Um, you can also find all our previous webinars there. Um, also check out the published case study. Uh, the link should be in the chat there uh, from this project uh, that was published, I think last year. And we also have over 170 case studies um, aside from that as well. Our next webinar will be next year, January 20th. This one will be from Danita Weeks from Colorado Mesa University, and she'll be speaking about bullfrogs and citizen science in the McKinnis Canyon Recreational Area. So please contact us if you would like to receive these announcements and are already on our mailing list. Um, thank you all again for your time and especially to you, Mark, for, for joining us and giving this, this really great presentation. Um, hopefully we'll see you all in the new year. Thanks, Christine Carly. Appreciate